Max. Max, 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 Max Satter. Welcome to Can. Thank you for having me. So we're at we're at day three now of Can. You haven't yet been to the conference. I have not been to the conference. <laughs> Slept a total of eight hours and about 12 coffees deep. So excited to chat today. I'm just curious, like, I mean, I, I was going to ask you about, like, what you think of the conference, like, from your perspective. I don't know if I'm, I'm the most qualified to, uh, given my, my experience. So wait, wait, let me just put some context out there for, for people who are listening. So Can Lions, it's an international ad festival, really, for agencies and agency recognition for, um, you know, the different work that they've done throughout the year. There's, you know, there are a couple of different festivals like this for agencies and, and work recognition. But uh, I think it's pretty rare where you get everyone in, in Europe mostly celebrating agencies. We were talking about this last night. We're usually like neglected in, in normal commerce conferences as like a provider or someone who's trying to pitch services. But here we're celebrated. You are no longer the black sheep for once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I, what I will say my experience has been is that kind of like you're saying it's actually been way less salesy than all other conferences I've attended. Granted, I've only attended the dinners and the happy hours, or I think there's this unspoken commitment to not being super salesy and trying to sell your stuff. But it's been nice. I think everyone is kind of a kindred spirit in that sense. Well, I think this one's like much more partnership focused because it's agency saturated. So I'm not going to sell another agency. It's just like you're here to meet people meet people that's the that's the status quo like you go to a tech conference you go to like shop talk or like e-tail or any of these other events they think like agency is just going to pitch them on services i think that's a stigma that's been developed because of like you know honestly d to c and also just that's why agencies go to these other conferences right is to actually pitch and close brands but here there's just not that mo so there's no even you know question okay so today i want to talk about i want to talk about unveiled I want to just talk about the, these 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 new solutions that have really popped up over the last five years, which is like de-anonymization, AI audience segmentation, um, and kind of the the kind of like sifting through the noise. Because I think a lot of brand founders they hear about these solutions now, and like there's like a lot of conjecture around it. Um, and the technology is super interesting, um, and I, it's it's obviously powerful. It does really good things for brands, but. Um, kind of want to understand the differences between the solutions and then where the tech is actually going. So t- start start us off with Unveiled and, and what you guys do. Maybe it makes sense to start talking about the problem that we solve and kind of why we why we exist before getting into Unveiled and the technology that we actually deliver and the solutions that we drive. At a, at a very high level, the reason why Unveiled exists is because we hear marketers and brands saying the same thing over and over and over again. And that is, it's not 2018 anymore, it's not 2019 anymore, where you put $1 into Meta and $2 into Google and you get $30 out. And brands are happy and smiling and everyone is rich and it's a great time and we're all successful. But it's not 2018 anymore, it's 2024. And for many reasons, one of them being just the increasing how easy it is now to effectively spin up a brand given tools and companies like Shopify, but also in large part because of how antagonistic Apple has been towards consumers and brands as well. So when I say this, what I mean is that back in 2018, Apple enabled third-party cookies, and there wasn't much signal loss gap between what's actually happening on any given company's website and their ability to recognize what's happening on their website. There was no signal loss gap. Over the last four years, everyone heard about iOS 14, And then Apple through Safari had something called ITP and then iOS 16. There has been a huge, huge deprecation in the amount of signal that brands and other solutions that are installed on brands' website are actually able to pick up on. So kind of actually now boiling boiling this down more, more tactically. With the most recent version of Safari launched in December 2023, if I come to lucasissues.com, I sign up on day one, and I come back just 25 hours later, I am now showing up as an anonymous first-time visitor rather than a known returning visitor. Huge signal loss gap. And there are a bunch of downstream implications from this, from Clavio flow revenue, whatever ESP you use, not getting triggered as much as they should be getting triggered, 
to event match quality deprecation on Meta and Google. So this is kind of the, the high level problem that we solve such that we are enabling brands to recognize what's actually happening on their website, just like it was in 2018, 2019, 2020, before this huge fallout by Apple. I mean, we talk about, you know, the implications of privacy tracking and degradation of cookies on this podcast a lot. Um, there's a whole, I think, generation of solutions now that are propping up to to kind of combat this issue, um, which has been really exciting to see just the ways in which the tech is evolving to kind of circumvent and give brands back the the signal and the throughput that they need for their advertising and their marketing tactics to be effective. Um, and that brings us to Unveiled. So you guys started as a de-anonymization solution. How are you doing that though? How are a lot of, how, how are you like administering that? Like how does the tech actually work? How I does think the that's, tech actually work? Yeah, I think that's the most, that's uh, the, that's very interesting. How is, how is the sausage made? No trade secrets here, but like give us an idea of like how, how you do these things. Totally. So Unveiled started off, like you said, exactly as an de-anonymization platform identity graph, different people have different verbiage. And we start off with two solutions specifically. The first solution if, was around helping brands recognize visitors who have explicitly opted in and given their email address. That was the first solution we offered. We call that Rekindle. This focuses on the 30% of American consumers today that use Safari. The second solution, and there's one set of technology for that, Essentially, it's leveraging first-party cookies, right? Apple has increasingly messaged, if you look at their, their earnings calls and their, their very much public-facing statements, they are all around enabling first-party cookies rather than third-party cookies. This is also what Chrome is going to do moving forward. So the tech for that is first-party cookies that we built. The second product that we initially launched with, we call Acquaint. Acquaint enables brands to recognize the high-intent visitors who have not yet given their email address, but they've maybe added to cart or checkout abandoned. Well, and okay, so for for that product though, I'm really curious because the identity graph it can only capture so much, right? So like, what what is the what is the percent match it on on individuals that you can actually locate and say this is that individual? Is it like twenty percent or for the first product? Uh, second uh, product. Second product. <coughs> let's th let's talk about both. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Frankly speaking, we're actually moving uh, away from Acquaint. We see that that first product, Rekindle, just drives so much more revenue. But to, to answer your question, it totally depends on the brand. On average, we'll say we identify around 20% of any given company's website visitors. It can be as high as 40% or as low as 5%. Now, we pass back only the highest intent people when we've seen them actually opt in into our identity graph somewhere. So basically their information needs to be available somewhere else too for, they, you to yeah. be, for you to match. Exactly. They have to opt in. Essentially we're part of a data co-op. And in order for us to be able to recognize them, they have to opt in to one of our data partners. Okay. And they opt in through other sorts of applications. Signing up. Like other brands or publishers. like A lot of publishers. So we work with a lot of publisher networks, um, some ESPs as well. And essentially, when they have some kind of authentication event, when they submit their email address to one of these data partners, that data partner will then pass that data to us. So you'd assume, though, that the, the ability to match an individual or a site visitor one-to-one -one would actually be higher than... It actually should be pretty high because I feel like a lot of consumers today, they're opting in to a lot of different... Yeah, it, it's, it ranges from the brand between, on average, 20%. I think we like to undersell and over deliver so frequently it's higher than this but frankly speaking i think kind of zooming out again we are seeing a lot of shifts in the privacy landscape and there is this new wave of, of startups coming and i think there's two distinct camps you have one camp which there are some legacy players maybe like retention.com for example that focus squarely on kind of riding the line of what is legal and what is compliant, but barely. And they are taking an approach that, of course, identity resolution solutions will always continue to exist and persist. That is the first camp. And I think we also now have a new camp saying identity and persistent identity is not the future anymore. The future is actually identity-less solutions. And an example of a company we have there is Fermat. So I, I think very, very highly of Fermat and, and, and Rishab. 
And I, their philosophy is the exact opposite camp of retention.com. They say, no, persistent identity will not exist over time. Rather, we have to personalize offers based off of the content they're engaging with. So when I think about Unveiled, we started off in camp number one. Well, so the identity list solution, just to interrupt really quickly, it doesn't, it's kind of like, it's like identity agnostic. It's like, I don't care who you are. It's just that you've made these certain actions or behaviors and that in and of itself creates an identity for the person, you know? Honestly, that's the same approach we take to CLV. It's like, we care less about the psychographics, like who they are, income, et cetera, et cetera. Like we really just care about the actions that they take on site. That's a bigger predictor of how the customer is going to behave in the future. Exactly. And I think that that unlock right there, which you just described, is why we have shifted effectively from camp number one, like the retention.coms of the world, to camp number two. And I, I think that has also informed our product roadmap where we still have solutions around persistent identity, but I kind of back to the point you hit on initially is where is the puck going? I think the puck is going and how do you act on top of this persistent identity? And it's about personalizing and figuring out the best next action based off the actual behaviors they've done rather than who they are. Where, where does, uh, what does that mean for your, your product suite? Yeah, so we have this effective data layer, which I just described, uh, identity graph, now focusing more so on people who have explicitly opted in and given the email address. And this allows brands to solve the signal loss gap between someone who signs up on day one and comes back on day 11. Before they show up as anonymous, now I can recognize them. Where we're moving is now how do we act on top of this? How do we build an intelligence layer on top of this identity layer? So tactically speaking, right now we are live with two products in the market. One of them is about personalizing the uh, a pop-up to improve the rate of first-party data opt-in. So essentially showing the pop-up at the right point in time to improve the rate of people who sign up. It's not a pop-up itself. It's about orchestrating the pop-up. And the second solution where we're seeing a lot of tailwinds as of late is analyzing, building a custom AI model on top of this data layer and figuring out which website visitors are high LTV and low LTV and then creating custom audiences and meta and Google to improve ROAS. And so that's, I've, I've, I've heard of solutions like that before. So Let's just describe for the layman here, like, how does the custom audience get built out? And then you're basically exporting that into Meta as like a lookalike audience, right? Yeah, spot on. So we'll create two audiences. We'll create one prospecting audience will be a lookalike based off of the second audience, which is the retargeting audience. So right now, a way a lot of retargeting campaigns work as you do last seven days, last 14 days, last end days. I mean, how, how does Darkroom do it? Yeah, I mean, we have a ton of different uh, windows uh, in terms of how we look We look back at things. I think for me, I'm, I'm more curious on the AI audience. It's like, how does that actually get built out? Got like, it. What, Got it. what is the... I you're, you're, all about, you're all about the, uh, how's the sausage made? Okay, sure. Better, not even that. I just like, I think my whole thing is I think there's like actually a lot of conjecture out there. There's a lot of technology solutions branding some of these mm, products yeah. and being like, it's an AI audience. It's going to give you a higher return on ad spend. It's like, what does an AI audience mean? You have first party data, you know, are you creating a collection of like predictive audiences using random emails? Like, that's what I'm more curious about. For sure. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll walk you through, yeah, step by step how, how it works. So step number one, implementation. Customer will just install our JavaScript tag. If you're using Shopify, the custom Shopify app, pretty straightforward. And then what happens over the next, depending on how much traffic you have, over the next seven to 10 days is we will be analyzing all the website behavior. And effectively what happens is we see when somebody converts. We say, okay, cool, this person this is all done, you know, automatically via AI. We're yeah, not actually tech, watching. Tech, yeah. Yeah. But we see when a person converts and we can say, okay, interesting. Now we saw 100 conversions in, let's say, seven days or 1,000 conversions. Uh, there has to be enough throughput in order for us to actually train the model. But after a certain number of actual conversions, we can very early on in a new website visitor or returning website visitor's customer journey say, okay, this person looks like someone who's going to convert at a high value. Or this does not look like someone who's going to convert at a high value. And from this, effectively, imagine we have 10 deciles of your website uh, visitors. And today you're retargeting, 
let's say you're spending about the same amount each, each decile based off of intent. What we're effectively, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here, but what we're effectively able to do is say, okay, interesting. These are the top three deciles based off of intent, expected LTV, whatever you're trying to optimize around. And spend 60% of your ad dollars in the top decile, 10% of your ad dollars on the second decile, another 10% of your ad dollars on the third decile, and the rest on the, you know, the bottom 70%. So effectively, we're helping brands retarget the highest intent, highest expected LTV visitors. And we're figuring this out by understanding what people who convert do on the site early on in their customer journey. So that's how it works for the retargeting. And then for the prospecting, just do a lookalike based off of this to see the audience. No, you're basically saying we need to analyze website behavior over time. You take, when you say decile, you mean like cohort. Yeah. So you see site behavior. There's some predictive analytics. You're basically saying these are the top converting cohorts based on, I'm assuming, like predictive CLV. That's like what the model is. It's like a Python model that looks at predictive CLV. So we can optimize around different metrics. Sometimes it's CLV, sometimes brands. I'm just saying like the way you find the highest value audience is through CLV, right? Are you using that metric as the- That, that is the most, that's the default metric we, we revert to. Occasionally brands will say, hey, listen, keep the custom model for us around a different metric, which we can do. It just takes more time. I'm sure that's time. very rare though, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like most people just want high CLV. I mean, this is the academic approach because CLV is a determinant of the value of your company if you have higher converting customers, you know. Totally. That's the school of thought, at least at Darkroom. So, okay, predictive. This is your highest converting cohort. You extract that audience. You push that to Facebook. Exactly. And Google. Yeah. And then tactically, in Facebook, you have just two audiences. Okay, so break down, demystify the AI part of that. The AI part is then the model. It's the predictive model saying... We're using this sort of machine learning algorithm to say these customers are going to be highest performing over time. Yeah, the AI is exactly like you said, right? It's in the being able to figure out very quickly on in a customer's journey who looks like or who act, not, it's not about who looks like, who acts like someone who's going to have a high CLV versus who someone who's going to have a low CLV and then creating that audience. So figuring out who to put in that audience is that's where the actual AI is. How much differentiation how much better can your model be that's what i want to understand then then another than another competitor like that's what i'm saying like is there commoditization between the models or because we built custom clv models or is it a question of time like i'm assuming the more you work with the brand the stickier you get the better the model becomes because you have a larger data set is that true this product has only been in market for three months we the way we set it up is a 30 day free trial. Everyone has seen a massive lift on those first 30 days. So I, I don't think this product has been in the market long enough for me to be able to confidently say that the ROAS lift that we drive on month three is higher than on month one. Frankly speaking, it takes a week to train the model. And after that, you see a pretty immediate lift. So you have immediate value capture. And then I'm more saying just like the way that you would identify top performing cohorts would get better over time. Hopefully. Uh, honestly, it's, it's too early to say. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beauty of this space. I, I, love, I love D2C because it literally changes like every six months. Yeah, yeah. For, for us on the agency side, we've had to like re consistently reinvent our services, our totally, approach. Totally. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I think like you were saying, this is a very buzzy it's a very buzzy area. And I think for good reason right now, if you go to any single brand and you say, you know, what keeps you up at night? Everyone kind of defaults to more efficient marketing, more efficient marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like on the actual vendor software side, what's your perspective on the, all these solutions? Because a lot of people kind of are just promising the world. Well, yeah, I think it's actually pretty character degrading <laughs> in a way. I mean, that's why I, I, we, we've taken the approach as an agency to be like brutally honest. Like we have a really interesting vantage point. I think... In terms of being very close with our tech partners, you know, we work and we work really close together, obviously. And I love the work that you're doing in this space. Um, I've seen other people do similar things, right? And have totally different approaches that uh, actually dictate how we think about introducing those people to brands. Um, I think my perspective is like a lot of, th there's a lot of conjecture, like, across technology, across agencies. There's just like 
a lot of people having different perspectives, the approach that we take is like brutal honesty and, you know, just telling brands like there's definitely tech you should be using that's, you know, going to help your marketing be more efficient, right? You should explore those solutions, make the best decision for you, use them. You don't want to be like, you know, behind. Um, but then there's also just like recognizing that like no single tech solution, no single agency solution is going to like make your business successful. Right. right. That was the conversation we were just having with Jackson, um, around like there are certain inherent qualities within your product that are going to define the repeat purchase mechanics of it. Right. Like, and then, um, there's only so much like your performance agency can do. Right. It's like, if you have great partners and great people in your corner, um, they're going to give you the proper advice. But I think the biggest issue surrounding founders, especially like solo practitioners, solo operators, is they're paying way too much attention to the echo chamber that's happening within the agency and technology space. And they're working with different partners, thinking those are going to be solves for, um, you know, issues that, that, uh, they're not paying attention to on like the brand marketing or, or organic side. Totally. So I think it's a mix of both. I think my advice to entrepreneurs is just like, you know, build a good business and it's the easiest thing to say, but like <laughs> build a good business and, uh, six years in <laughs> yeah, yeah, build a good business and, uh, talk to your customers and figure out how you can, you know, make your product interesting to them and then, you know, show up in those channels. That point is so true though. What you're saying is that at the end of the day, an agency like Darkroom can create the best creative, you can have the best performance marketing in the world, but if the product isn't inherently profitable, it's just, it's just difficult. And I think that we're kind of now, again, this is nothing new, I'm not saying anything groundbreaking here, but we're now seeing this, this cohort of, of brands that you know, came online the last three or four years during the COVID boom and maybe five years, and they had this massive, massive success, this crescendo during you know, this, this Zerp times. Uh, and now it's it's really difficult for them. And that, but some some brands are are really killing it. Totally, they're really killing it. And so I think you need to look at the ones that are really killing it and say why why are they doing so well? And one, I've, one I've reason this, they use Unveiled. I've done this. Yeah, no, no, no other. Uh, they're using Unveiled in Darkroom. <laughs> um, no, I think the the reason that I keep coming back to is like okay. Uh, and by the way, like I, I've never, I haven't always thought this. Like before, I was of the camp when I started at the agency. I was like, you just need to work with the best agency. They deliver the best creative, and like everything's gonna be great, right? And uh, that's that's not true. But yeah, the brands that are doing really well, first of all, I always come even when businesses I invest in. It's like, is the founder gonna win? Like, mm -hmm. are they just are they just gonna figure it out? Um, and are they scrappy? And like, you know, are they someone we want to be betting on? that really informs the type of business that they end up creating. Because I think when I talk to a brand, it's like a snapshot in time. You need to see the potential of like where that business can go. Cause so many things can change. Pivots happen, you know, it's a work in progress. Yeah. So I look at those businesses that do well and I'm like, okay, great repeat purchase, great unit economics. Um, and then marketing is like kind of like the layer on top. It's like, how are those founders choosing to market themselves? And the best founders or the best businesses, they figure out marketing. And that's either by hiring a really good CMO or head of growth who's like done it before. And they're, they've, they've been through the noise and there's, there's no bullshit. Um, or the founders themselves are really good marketers. Yeah. And they're just not wasting their time on exploring different solutions like they know exactly what they want to do totally i think also the, the founders that one of the reasons why we're growing at the pace that we're growing so so quickly honestly this is the third or fourth company i've started and i've failed a, a bunch of times <laughs> so uh kind of pinching myself um like is this is this really happening um but one of the reasons why we're scaling so quickly is exactly just because Marketing is not, specifically performance marketing, is not as efficient as it used to be. So when brands hear what we have to say, they say, really, you can improve my blended ROAS 15%, 20%. Is this, is this real? And when we actually, there's a lot of buzz in the market, for sure. I totally agree. And I think the way we kind of navigate this is by saying we do a free 30-day trial so you can actually see the results before you pay us a single dollar. But I think the reason why 
we're scaling so so quickly is because of the pain point. That is, frankly, how do you drive efficient marketing? And I, I think almost always performance marketing is going to be maybe the biggest line I'm on the budget. But we're seeing a lot of success also with the brands, not on our end, but the brands that are most successful that we're seeing are the ones that have marketing where the founders or the figureheads, like you were saying, who just create content, organic content, cheap impressions, free impressions, really. And the brand is native to whatever kind of content that he create. Yeah, I, th- I think you're, you're right about that. I, that's one of the hardest things that I've been working on is just like the consistent content motion. Like you just need to make it a habit. It's like working out, you know, you just need to integrate it into your routine. Um, and I think it's becoming more important, obviously, like today than it was, you know, 10 years ago, a decade ago, when you could really build a big business and kind of remain in the shadows. I would have loved that, by the way. That would have been great. Yeah, I feel like that's what I'm trying to do. But I, I just have to, like you're saying, I have to create content. Like right now, it's all been word of mouth and referrals. But it only scales so so much. You can, you can build a great business on, on word of mouth and referrals. And I think... Where we're at right now, it's like to get to the next level, it's just we need to be developing a marketing motion for the agency that's that allows us to kind of like expand our surface area for success. So that's why we're here in Can making content, podcasting. No, Max, thanks so much for joining. Gee, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, no, it's been fun. Uh, I'm excited to finish out the conference. We got two more days. Good. There's some good, there's some good brands here. A lot of agencies. I'm here for the agencies. I'm here for the agencies as well. We'll end on that note. Max, (laughs) thanks so much. Thanks Uh, for having me. We'll talk soon. Cheers. Cheers.